So next up we have Dr. Wenzong Zhao. Uh, he leads the Harvard MECFS collaboration uh, with Dr. Ron Tompkins. He's uh, Associate Professor at, in Surgery and Bioinformatics at Harvard Medical School and M MGH. He's a member of the Scientific Advisory Board at OMF. He directs the MGH Inflammation and Metabolism Computational Center, and he also leads the Computational Genomics Group at Stanford as well. So he's a very busy man. Um, he's going to talk about the open data sharing platform. Thank you very much, Wenzel. Thank you. Thank you, please. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we're a little bit uh, short of time, so I'll, I'll try to uh, go through the slides quickly, and we can end by uh, 3.45 uh, to be on schedule. For the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, what data available um, on the website of uh, Open Medicine Foundation and uh, uh, what we are working with collaborators and practically everyone um, in the research community to look at this data and uh, uh, what has been done and what's in the works. So as we have heard um, quite a few talks this afternoon about the science uh, behind CFS, and we know that as a complex disease, there are many potential reasons uh, as causes of ME-CFS, from genes to infections to the environment. So in order to find the potential causes of CFS and uh, perhaps more importantly, find the treatment for patients, we actually have to look everywhere for the clues. And uh, as Ron and other um, experts already mentioned, because of the little funding available to MECFS, unfortunately, most of the studies today only can look at uh, one or two aspects of you know, all the things, among all the things, and on a small uh, group of patients. Therefore, the findings from each individual studies need to be compared so you can find a rigorous signal and data collected from different levels, for example, uh, measuring genes versus measuring uh, infections, need to be integrated so we can find something called uh, a chain of evidence um, that could potentially lead us to the cause of the disease. So we have heard enough of this, um, and because of this, early on, Open Medicine Foundation, under the leadership of Dr. Ron Davis, adopted this uh, policy uh, of open data, um, which means that uh, as soon, pretty much as soon as a experiment is done, uh, we try to put data on the internet and share with researchers uh, in the community, basically uh, all over the world. And who, you know, whoever registered on this website can see the raw data and the type of findings um, that have been uh, studied by our own team. And often they would uh, you know, tell us uh, what are the findings that we perhaps are missing or they have a different interpretation uh, of the results. So I think that's uh, very important. Because of the time, I would only be able to give you sort of a couple of <laughs> glimpse uh, of what's on the website. Um, so this is um, the sort of the front end uh, of the website. It's uh, mecfs.stanford.edu. At the moment, we'll have another mirror site uh, on the Harvard domain soon. So the, as you can see here, each study is separated uh, into different levels based on the type of the study, either the clinical information of the patients or the clinical lab tests of the patients. Um, or the different type of molecular measurements, uh, genes, proteins, metabolites, microbiome, et cetera. So the data are separated into different levels, and then um, we would compare the patients as a group with the controls. And that results are also available on the website for people to study. Um, and perhaps more interestingly, uh, we would like to integrate 
data from different levels together. So if you have a gene uh, that appears to be abnormal in one patient, you would want to see whether the protein that's coded by this gene is also affected and whether the function of that protein is indeed impaired in the patient. So just as an example, um, obviously, <laughs> this takes a lot of people's work, and, and that's a list of people that actually contributed to this website. So this is just one example. Um, oops. Here, uh, you can see that particular patient, and this is a particular test that one can choose, and that's the particular threshold um, of filtering, so you can choose what you want to see, and this shows the results. This happened to be a, a cytokine data of one particular patient, and uh, he or she uh, had two uh, abnormal tests uh, in terms of their, uh, in, in terms of uh, the patient's cytokine levels. So these are the patient groups, these are the control groups, and this triangle indicates the level of the patient. So you can see that this particular patient has much lower level of this cytokine, which is called the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, which is involved in uh, a number of neurological diseases as a biomarker, actually, for some of those diseases. So this patient has a you know, really low level, um, not only comparing to the controls, but also comparing to other patients. So that's potentially value that we want to gather from this title platform. And similarly, um, the other one, which is CD40L, uh, Maureen uh, talked about uh, the functions of T cells. CD40L is one of those uh, cytokines that, uh, that uh, would affect uh, T cell functions, for example. And here you see that between patient, uh, between patient groups and control group, there's actually no difference. However, the level of this particular patient uh, for this particular cytokine is much lower. So I hope that uh, while we grow enough number of these kind of observations, people can start to uh, link things together. And um, this is just our current attempt of doing so. Um, so, so each row here is, is one phenotype, for example, sleep problems, uh, cognitive test problems, uh, pain, fatigue, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, we measure a lot of those. And uh, each row here is the uh, correlation of one of the uh, analyte at different levels that's si significantly correlated with any of these symptoms um, of, of patients. So the uh, red-ish color shows positive correlation, for example, cortisol level. And the bluish color shows um, negative correlation. And as we heard from the clinicians um, early on, uh, since there's you know, a, a, a rather large heterogeneity among different patients. Um, this is one of the reasons that we want to do this type of analysis to see what are the uh, indicators that would be most correlated with a particular type of uh, 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 symptom of the patients. Yeah, so this is the groups, the physical functions, cognitive functions, and, and sleep problems. Um, so these are our gene results, as Ron already mentioned. Um, we try to sequence the whole genome of, of patients as much as we can. Um, and one of the benefits of that, um, Ron already mentioned uh, one of the findings. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the other way of looking at the data would be that we can actually find those rare pathogenic variants uh, in each patient. You know, realistically, f for most of us, we have, you know, pathogenic variants, one or the other. The question more is that whether those variants contribute or potentially contribute to the disease. So just as an example, uh, here's uh, CFTR, which is, the, oops, which is cystic fibrosis gene. And you can see that uh, there are two, uh, we call heterozygous variants there because, you know, Obviously, this is one of those variants that's common uh, in, 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 in the Caucasian population. Uh, perhaps more importantly, we see actually a lot of these variants that are known to be involved in uh, potentially uh, neurological diseases. So because of time, I'll just uh, show you uh, a rough 
comparison. So what this is is, is to ask the question, if you uh, look at the pathways of those variants I showed you uh, in the previous slide and ask what have been done on these variants in the study of other diseases, for example, in pain, uh, in sleep disturbance, in cognitive impairment. And to our surprise, as you can see here, uh, more than 50% of the variants that I showed you are actually known to be involved in all those symptoms. So since we only look at a few patients, as, as Ron mentioned, these were severely ill patients in this particular study, uh, we thought that we should uh, you know, test whether it's uh, accidental findings. We used UK Biobank data there. They have uh, somewhere around uh, two, 3,000 CFS patients. And you can see that uh, if we take their data, uh, we would get a weaker but still uh, significant signal there. So um, this just give you uh, some uh, clue um, of what we're trying to do and um, you know, trying to see whether uh, we can use this type of information to identify the co potential cause of the disease um, as well as um, trying to borrow strengths from studies of other diseases uh, that might be useful for treating uh, ME CFS patients um, one day. Now, because of the time, <laughs> I'll probably just stop here. <laughs>